So what I want to talk about today is life on Mars and have we already detected it? Um, I don't want to do very much historical investigation of this, uh, but we do have to go into the history briefly before we get to um, current issues. What I want to concentrate mostly on is uh, a hypothesis paper that um, argues that the structures that you see on this rock surface on this, um, in this Curiosity rover image are in fact relics of microbial mats and are therefore fossils of ancient life from Mars. So this question of life on Mars now or has there ever been um, has been a subject of scientific speculation since the 1800s. Um, most of you are probably familiar with Schiaparelli's mapping of the surface of Mars, in which he described canali, um, which in Italian can mean channels or canals, i.e. other either abiotic waterways or biotically um, constructed ones. Uh, but in the English translations of his books, it was mostly translated as canals, whereas uh, you'd have to read the context to determine whether it's channels or canals is the correct um, translation. However, to English speaking readers, um, this idea of canals on Mars was very stimulating, and soon afterwards, uh, Percival Lowell, um, as you can see in the lower right, uh, produced another map of the surface of Mars. Uh, in this time, in this case, there were straight canals um, all over the um, more equatorial regions of Mars, and he argued that they were constructed by intelligent life. He didn't say when. Um, they could be ancient, extinct intelligent life or extant intelligent life. Um, the possibility of life on Mars then became very popular. And of course, H.G. Wells wrote the famous novel War of the Worlds, um, which uh, described a scenario where there was extant intelligent life on Mars. And this was um, a very popular and influential book. By the time we put the first um, landers on Mars in 1976, with the Viking landers, um, astrobiologists were aware that there weren't, in fact, canals on Mars. There had been flybys. Uh, by spacecraft which photographed the surface of Mars in substantially more detail than you could determine from uh, Earth-based telescopes. Um, however, despite that, the Viking landers carried astrobiological experiments that searched for extant life on Mars. Two of the experiments um, the pyrolytic release experiment and the gas exchange experiment yielded um, pretty unequivocal evidence that there was no extant life in the soils of Mars. But the labelled release experiment was rather more ambiguous. Um, this, provide, uh, this experiment um, uh, neutrified Martian soil with organic compounds that had been labelled with carb radioactive carbon-14. And uh, at least in the first edition of these nutrients, the detector detected carbon-14 that was generated from the, uh, CO2 that was generated from the soil that was labelled with carbon-14. A repeat experiment found much less carbon dioxide that had been radioactively labelled, which is 
all. Um, most scientists regarded this as being too contradictory and ambiguous to uh, regard as evidence of life. But the principal investigator on the experiment, still, even as recently as 2016, argues that extant life is a strong possibility as indicated by this labelled release experiment. Subsequent to this rather ambiguous finding from Viking, uh, the next piece of evidence as to whether the, there is or was life on Mars came from the Mars meteorite, ALH84001. And in this meteorite, a team of scientists um, discovered uh, microscopic structures that they said resembled microfossils uh, associated with organic molecules, polyaromatic uh, hydrocarbons, which they argued were um, derived from the decay and breakdown of microorganisms, and they discovered magnetite crystals, which had morphologies that at the time were only known to be produced by magnetotactic bacteria. So they argued that um, these were signs that in the distant past, Mars had in fact had microscopic life. Um, this caused a sensation, obviously. There was a press conference with the president announcing the discovery um, with propaganda. Uh, but scientists took a rather more sober view of this evidence. Um, and upon re-examination, it turned out that the organic compounds were either terrestrial contamination or more likely from an abiotic origin than a biological origin. Uh, the microfossils are too small to represent uh, cells. They're on the order of nanometers in scale. And um, to enclose the cellular mach machinery of even the smallest modern microorganism, you would have to have an object that was somewhat larger than the 100 uh, nanometer size scale of many of these objects. Then it turned out that the magnetite crystal morphologies were not in fact exclusively biological. They could be produced um, by thermal metamorphism of uh, iron bearing carbonate minerals abiotically without the involvement of any microorganisms. So um, we were left with the rather uncertain status of whether there was or is life on Mars. Then in 2015, uh, this paper referenced in the upper right was published in Astrobiology um, and it reported possible microbially induced sedimentary structures uh, that were detected in image, images um, taken by the Curiosity rover in Gale Crater. And these were on bedding planes of rocks that are uh, getting close to four billion years old. Now this of course is about the right time frame when we think Mars might have been much wetter than it is now, and uh, it is not totally implausible that you should have microbial mats binding sediment surfaces at this particular time in Mars history. Now, microbially induced sedimentary structures are made by microbial mats, but unlike the more familiar stromatolites, which are three dimensional microbial structures that are built up by mats in carbonate environments, uh, microbially induced sedimentary structures are two-dimensional. They form on the surface 
of siliciclastic sand, um, quartz sand and other silicate minerals. Uh, as a result, uh, um, more difficult to recognize than stromatolite, which stick out of the rock in three dimensions and you can measure many different features of them, whereas miss microbial induced sedimentary structures uh, really just irregular, slight irregularities on the surface and are harder to interpret. You'll see in the picture, in the image in the lower right, you have irregularities on the bedding surface of this sandy sediment that have been um, illustrated in an interpretive di diagram and treats them as ripped up microbial maps. You'll notice that there are uh, leading statements like flipped over maps and mat chips and so on. You'll also notice that this has been published as a hypothesis article, um, which astrobiology publishes infrequently. Um, but if you read the paper, you get the impression that it may have been the editor uh, that insisted that it be published as a hypothesis article and that the author was um, rather more convinced of the biogenicity of these structures than the editor was. Um, I believe the editor of hypothesis articles in that journal at that time was University of Washington's very own John Barros. So if he was indeed responsible for this um, being published with um, a degree of um, skepticism about uh, the strength of the interpretation, well, he did the right thing. So this was a very influential paper. It's been cited over 60 times in the five years since it was published. And many of the papers that spark up, uh, cited um, are also claiming to have detected biotic structures in Mars images. There's been a whole outbreak of such papers. Uh, some of the things that just in the last 12 months have been claimed to have been found in uh, rover images from Mars are colonies of photosynthesizing mushrooms, possible microbialites and algae, algae lichens, fossils, minerals, microbial mats and stromatolites, ichnofossils, these are trace fossils. Uh, formed by the activities of organisms that uh, look rather stick-like. The authors of these papers come from respectable institutions, but they're often not from departments particularly relevant to astrobiology. And in fact, many of this outbreak of papers reporting biological structures share common authors. So um, it seems like well, there are a lot of these papers. It's not a lot of scientists have um, been persuaded by uh, this technique for detecting life on Mars. So um, the question arises, are all microbially induced sedimentary structures so-called miss, are they all necessarily microbial? Well, um, a year after the astrobiology paper was published, um, a group of British scientists and Canadian scientists uh, took issue with this whole idea that all miss were microbial. And they showed, uh, Davies et al. showed that uh, 
many abiotic processes produce structures that were very similar, if not identical, to some of the structures that had been previously cited as microbial. Uh, you can see on the right um, various things that are almost identical to previously described myths that are produced by gas escape. Um, it could be that the gas is metabolic and reflects microbes but or microbial activity, but the structures themselves are nothing to do with microbial maps and are not formed by directly by any microbial process. So this calls into question the possibility that the Mars myths are in fact not evidence of past microbial life. So that's where things stood in 2016. To address this question, which I consider to be a highly significant question, because if we do discover fossil evidence of microbial life on Mars, it will be the first detection, positive detection of life outside the Earth. Um, I went on a beach vacation with my kids to Australia, in fact, two of them. Now, because it was summer, and very hot, we stayed near beaches, and we all spent a lot of time looking at sand. And as a result of that, we made some relevant observations and discussed astrobiological implications. And I'll show you what we saw. Firstly, we went to two areas on the east coast and the west coast. Uh, the main location that we examined was Racecourse Beach, south of Sydney. But we found the same things on the famous Bondi Beach of Sydney. And over on the west coast, um, we looked at beaches on the Swan Estuary, which were not facing the sea and open surf, but were sheltered and protected. We also went to look at uh, true microbially induced sedimentary structures on Rottnest Island, offshore of Perth. So here's our main study site, Racecourse Beach. You can see that there's a surf zone uh, offshore, uh, a region of swash structures where the waves wash up the beach, up to the rack line of the um, uh, high tide seaweed that's been washed up. And you can also see that there's a creek channel cutting across uh, the beach, and that funnel swash up the creek at times of highest tide. For scale, we have some kangaroos there. So what we found was that at the top of the swash zone on these beaches, at the high tide line, there are four different types of sedimentary structures um, formed in wet sand, deposited on top of warm dry sand, that closely to very closely resembled a range of microbially induced sedimentary structures. These can be categorized as negative, positive swash line structures and degraded swash structures. In several cases, we were able to observe them being formed when uh, wave run up and placed wet, a wet sand film on dry sand. We couldn't take a movie of them, however, because it was unpredictable where they would form and which wave would produce uh, a suitable amount of swash um, to generate them. But we did observe that in all cases they formed within seconds and critically with no evident biological involvement. So this is what they look like. This is the negative structures. You can see the wet sand film is a bit darker colored. The dry sand is paler. And you'll see the negative structures look a bit like 
impact craters of meteorites. Uh, there's floored with dry sand, and then they have an upraised rim of wet sand that may be deeply inclined, vertical, or in some cases, even overturned. They can have quite a range of morphologies from subcircular to ellipsoidal, to elongate, to irregular, to linear arrays of ellipsoids. So they are not all perfectly crater-like. Uh, you can see the scale there, that's a coin of a couple of centimetres across. Um, it's clear that the irregularly shaped ones are produced either by uneven underlying topography, um, the one in the upper right, for instance, you can tell is on a bit of a mound in the underlying sediment, or they're produced where you get impingement of two swash zones. The lower left, you can see two swash lobes, same way, but different lobes are meeting on a beach cusp and they impinge upon each other and leave irregular structures. Now, here's some close-up views of the margins of the negative structures. And you can see in the upper left how steep their sides can be, and in the lower left, in the lowermost structure, you can see um, an overturned rim to some of these, to one of these structures. Now, remember that this is sand, and sand is not meant to um, form slopes of anything more than about 40 degrees. That's the maximum natural angle of repose of sand. Moist sand can be a bit steeper, but to be vertical or overturned is not meant to occur in moist sand without some sort of biological binding agent to it. So here are some positive swash structures. These are ones that are formed by um, broken up films of uh, water sand slurry deposited by splashing onto dry sand, where a swash a sheet washes up a creek bed and splashes up over the side. So instead of being negative craters, like the negative structures are, these have positive relief. They stand up above the dry sand rather than being a crater within the wet sand. You can see some are droplet shaped, but some are spatulate, tongue shaped, some are irregular, um, and some are elongate. The swash line structures mark the very extremity of wave swash reaching up onto dry sand. And you can see that these are sometimes just smooth sometimes over steep and ridges, sometimes overturned, as you can see in the lower left, and sometimes variable along the swash lobe, lobe going from um, just slightly thickened to overturned, which you can see in the bottom right. And then there are degraded swash structures. Um, in A, there are fresh, negative, positive, and swash line structures, and then moving away in the same area of the beach, you go into moderately degraded swash structures in B, strongly degraded ones in C, and severely degraded ones in D. Um, so, the fresh ones look quite sharp and clear, but as they get more and more degraded, they become less and it becomes less and less obvious what their origin 
So these structures occurred on all the beaches we examined, both on open marine surf beaches with port sand, or also on estuarine beaches, like the ones in the two figures on the right, which are low energy. You can see how small the waves are there and that they're almost landlocked. They almost resemble lakes. And the sand here, instead of being quartz, is carbonate sand. So it doesn't seem, the mineralogy of the sand doesn't seem to influence their formation at all. In all cases, they found, were found only at the highest swash extent, at the high tide level on the beach. And they always developed where wet sand impinges on very dry sand. And they can survive several tidal cycles. Uh, obviously, they get degraded over time. And it's at least plausible that they could get preserved in the geological record if sand dunes, which form at the back of the beaches, back of most of the beaches, I should say, are prograded over the beach and preserved um, these structures on the undersurface of um, migrating sand dunes. So have these things been observed before? The only report in the literature that I could find was one figure in the 2016 paper by Davies who called into question the um, necessarily biological origin of mist structures. Um, this is figure A on the left, which is from a Port Sand Beach in Northern Scotland, where quite clearly they're observing the same sort of structures as we saw on race course and the other beaches. But that is the only record of these things that I could find in the literature, going all the way back to Charles Lyle. Could find it. They must have been seen before because they're so common, but clearly without an astrobiological mindset, no one paid too much attention to these structures. So how did they form? Well, from observing them, in the uppermost swash zone, there is a thin film of water sand flurry rushes upwards in seconds and it overrides an underlying dry sand layer um, that has um, a differential degree of hydrophilicity. The um, um, likelihood that water will get absorbed into the pore spaces between the sand grain. So moist sand is very hydrophilic and um, a sand grain coated in uh, hydrogen bonded water molecules will want to bond more water um, into the interstices between the sand grains because of the pre-existing water wanting to make hydro hydrogen bonds with um, uh, other water molecules. Whereas dry sand needs to be wetted first before it becomes highly hydrophilic. So it's relatively hydrophobic compared to the wet sand. So where there are surface irregularities in the dry sand in the substrate that disturb the slurry film, no sand layer gets deposited because of this differential in the propensity of water infiltrate the sand. And then, once the swash um, wave has um, is, uh, reached its maximum point, the edges of some of these structures start to retract upwards due to the surface tension and um, capillary action and the, again the hydrophilicity difference between the dry sand and the wet sand. And so 
The sand can initially be held at angles steeper than the maximum angle of repose by surface tension. And then as it dries out, salt crystallizes between the sand grains, which retains the over steepened margin of some of these structures. Uh, as you've probably observed, all geologists eat the rocks they're studying. And we did in fact eat some of these structures and they tasted very salty after they were dry. Now, the Davies paper that first reported these suggested that they are formed by bursting gas bubbles that were trapped within sand. But from our observations, gas bubbles have nothing to do with it. We saw um, foamy gas bubbles at the advancing edge of a swash sheet and where they were were not where the, these structures were formed. But we think it's much more likely that cohesive forces from surface tension and capillary action within a thin film of moist sand compared to the underlying warm dry sand plus the difference in hydrophilicity slash hydrophobicity between the two um, types of sand causes their formation. But it's clear that they only form where wetting time is very short, less than a few seconds. And particularly, this would be the case where surface irregularities in the substrate minimize the wetting time. It was obvious from our observation that the speed of their formation, the style of their formation, and the environment of for formation precludes the possibility of any microbial binding, because they form instantaneously, and precludes the possibility of any adhesion because of organic mucilage, microbial snot. It's just not there either in the wet sand layer or the dry sand layer. But these things are clearly not microbial. So going back to Mars, what are these structures on Mars? Um, here's the, at the top, the original image or one of the original images that was purported to have microbially induced sedimentary structures on that bedding plane. And at the bottom is an interpretive diagram um, ascribing the origin of these irregularities on the bedding plane to microbial mats. You'll note that there are mat chips there. Uh, there are erosional pockets, erosional remnants, um, flipped over mat, uh, and fringed mat. And I would maintain that within the four types of swash zone structures, there are abiotic structures that are closely resemblant of all of these alleged different types of microbial mat structure. So the interpretive diagrams from Mars illustrate microbially induced sedimentary structures that closely resemble degraded swash zone structures. Um, you'll notice that none of them are very sharp or clearly defined. Um, the erosional pockets resemble the negative swash zone structures. The mat chips resemble positive swash zone structures. Fringe mat, mat folds and erosional re remnants all closely resemble swash line structures. And one, one other image, though, um, Nofke I've identified um, a microbially induced sedimentary structure called a ruptured gas dome. You can see the image at the top right, uh, an interpretive diagram, the bottom 
and in the middle. Now, ruptured gas domes are important because um, they're perhaps the most convincingly biotic of all mist structures. They form when microbial mass metabolism or decay, decay is just a micro, dead microbial mat being metabolized by live microbes, then metabolism or decay produces gas, which accumulates between beneath the mat surface, causing a bubble-like domical blister in the mat surface. And if enough gas accumulates, the dome bursts like a blister, forming a crater-like round or ellipsoidal structure with raised margins and a depressed center. But these directly illustrate two important biological features. One is metabolism. Um, most definitions of life and of biosignatures um, involve the recognition of metabolism. And it's also uh, a sign of behavior, the binding the sand rim by microbial filaments or mucilage uh, illustrates microbial growth and movement. So metabolism and behavior are recorded by ruptured gas domes. So these are the most convincingly biotic of all microbially induced sedimentary structures. But here's the same sort of thing in a swash structure, a negative swash structure. You can see it looks like a burst bubble or dome with raised rims, in this case, vertical or overturned rim and a crater-like floor. Um, so, something that looks like a ruptured gas dome is not necessarily that. There are abiotic processes that can mimic the production of ruptured gas domes. But lastly, the Nofke paper argued that the spatial distribution, the arrangement in two dimensions, and the temporal succession, the sequence in three dimensions, is indicative of a biological origin for the Mars microbially induced sedimentary structure. You can see here that the distribution, spatial distribution of negative swash structures on beaches can be pretty similar to the ruptured gas domes um, that were recorded in the Mars images. Not only that, the temporal succession these swash structures could conceivably um, also be similar to the Mars ones if fresh and degraded structures are stacked on aggrading shorelines, ones that build upwards over time. So therefore neither spatial distribution or nor temporal succession are strong arguments for the biogenicity of mist structures. So just to check, we went to Rottnest Island off shore from Perth uh, to look at um, true microbially induced sedimentary structures on the shores of Government House Lake, a water body on the left, which has proper subaqueous stromatolite growing within it now. And on the shores of the lake are these um, small marsupials called quokkas that are now famous because this gentleman, Roger Federer, the Swiss tennis star, um, decided to make himself and them famous by taking selfies of them. So if you look at the ruptured gas domes in a real microbial mat, they're more irregular than the negative swash, swash structures. They also have thicker rims 
but they're no steeper. And as you can see in these two images, they're only rarely overturned. The big difference, however, is that they contain large amounts of organic matter interlayered with sand. These things are 70, 80 percent organic matter as opposed to the negative swash structures, which contain none at all. So, as a result of this beach vacation and thinking about astrobiology while sun baking with the kids, um, I come to the following conclusion. Firstly, that the Mars myth, myth hypothesis is in fact highly speculative. And that almost all of the purported Mars microbially induced sedimentary structures have swash zone equivalents that are formed by purely abiotic processes. Both space and time and their distribution in that are plausible in beach environments. And it doesn't have to be a microbially bound surface. And the most likely myths that have been reported from Mars, the ruptured gas dome, um, to be sure that they have that origin of ruptured microbial mat, you would need to see internal organic layers between sand laminae before you could be fairly confident of a biogenic origin. So, as a result, the recognition of microbially induced sedimentary structures really requires closer inspection than just looking at distant images of a bedding plane in a landscape, which is um, the evidence that we have from Mars at present. Uh, none of those surfaces have been drilled or geochemically analyzed closely. So, my thought on the likelihood of fossilized microbial life on Mars is that the curiosity images are not very persuasive of microbially induced sedimentary structures. Most are like, and in some very like, degraded swash structures, but they could also plausibly be judged as abraded sedimentary rock layers that have been um, sandblasted by wind erosion. They're not obviously microbially induced sedimentary structures. Uh, the purported ruptured gas domes, the most convincingly biogenic of mist, can in fact be mimicked by completely abiotic negative swash structures. Um, particularly if all you can see is the external physical shape of the thing. Um, so the Mars myth should not be regarded as compelling or even likely evidence of fossilized extraterrestrial microbial life. So in conclusion, despite the recent discovery reported discovery of phosphine in the atmosphere in, of Venus, we still have no strong evidence that life used to or does exist elsewhere in the solar system. But to finish, I would like to make some acknowledgements to Alastair Buick and Hamish Buick, who took all the photos made lots of relevant observations and drew the diagrams, which was um, quite an accomplishment for kids who were 10 years old at the time. They really got in to um, uh, shoreline astrobiology. In fact, we went to ocean shores the other weekend on Labor Day and they went straight off to the swash zone looking for more of these structures. I'd also like to thank Michael Hughes, one of the world's experts on swash structures, 
who advised on the possible mechanism of formation of these. And I would like to acknowledge no organisation or foundation for financial support because this was done with no research grants whatsoever. So with that, I'll finish and um, I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone may have. Great, uh, thank you very much, Roger. Let's all uh, give him a virtual round of applause. I'll applaud for real. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for that uh, presentation. Uh, what I'd like to do now is uh, turn it over to uh, questions that anybody might have for Roger. So what I'm gonna uh, ask you all to do is that if you would like to ask a question, uh, please raise your virtual hand. Uh, and then um, uh, when I call on you, please unmute your mic and uh, turn on your video so you can ask uh, Professor Buick directly. So um, anybody have any questions? All right, first up I see uh, Tom Quinn. Hey Roger, um, so how surprising would it be to find swash zones on Mars? Well, you have to remember where Curiosity rover was, Gale Crater, which was supposed to have had a large lake at the base of it. And lakes, of course, have beaches, and depending on prevailing wind directions, they have waves uh, and can cause wave uprush on the beaches. That's part of the reason we went to this quasi lake estuarine environment that was almost completely landlocked and only microtidal, but had swash zones produced purely by wind. And we found on the estuary that they had the same sort of structures as we found on the macrotidal surf beaches. Um, so I see no reason why the lake at the bottom of Gale Crater couldn't have had beaches and couldn't have had swash zones that had um, sandy swash structures on them. Mute, sorry, I was mute. Um, it's great, thank you. Uh, David Catlin, did you have a question? I see you, you maybe you've taken your hand down. Well, it was the same question as Tom Quinn's really, which was whether the, you know, on, on, on Earth you have tides, uh, but Mars doesn't have a big moon, so you have to just rely on other effects. And it's not clear that these swash structures would be so common, but I guess Roger's already answered that. Great. Thanks, Roger. Did you have anything else you wanted to add? Um, if you look at Green Lake, in Seattle, look at the beaches there, depending on the wind direction and the size of the waves, on a little lake with just a kilometre or so wave fetch, you get swash zones that are up to three metres wide or so. And that is completely non-tidal. So I think a big lake like Gale Crater, which could have had substantial wind fetch, and perhaps a thicker atmosphere as well um, would have had waves of moderate height that would have swashed up beaches to a considerable extent. Great, thanks. Uh, next is Sanjoy. Hey Roger, those are really keen observations and I appreciate the shout out to the second most famous Roger after you, of course. Um, could you speak to the geological preservation of the swar structures? Have they been found in a rock record on Earth? Um, to my knowledge, no, they haven't. I did a literature search for these things and couldn't find anything, um, particu particularly nothing like the negative and positive um, swash structures. The swash lines have been reported, but not with the highly raised rims that 
we found in the fresh one. Um, it looks like to get incorporated into the geological record, um, you would necessarily have some degradation of um, the fine features of some of these structures that we observed freshly formed on the beach. But swash line structures have been reported in the geological record, getting preserved um, on beaches that have been um, buried under migrating sand dunes. Right, thank you. Uh, next, we have a question from Dale. Thanks, Rory. Um, this is maybe more like a speculation, but if um, these swash structures are due to, to wind waves, uh, it suggests that the atmosphere was thicker. And uh, although it might be quite a lot of work, I wonder whether geometry of these swash structures could be used to um, say something about the height of the waves and from that and the fetch something to, to constrain the atmospheric density at the time. Um, that's a very interesting speculation, but I would divert your attention away from the swash structures, which really only form very close to the uppermost up, uprush of the thin film of wave water. Mm. I said, Yes, that it would be better done with ripples in the surf zone where the waves actually break. Ah. Um, and I have actually tried that um, on in Archean beach rocks on Earth to try and work out if you could go surfing on an Archean beach. <laughs> I had an honor student in Sydney who was a surfer. And he wanted some way of mixing geology and surfing in a research project. And so I put him onto this very task. And he worked out a way of measuring ripple height and wavelength um, and uh, working out what that said about wave height um, on mm -hmm. Archean, well, modern and Archean beaches because we didn't know the wave fetch, because we don't know how wide Archean oceans were, we couldn't work that out. But he was able to conclude his thesis with the sentence that um, the only surfing that could be done on an Archean beach was by a little kid on a foamy, which is, <laughs> sorry, a proper surf, surfer talk a grommet on a foamy, which means a little kid on a styrofoam surfboard. <laughs> he concluded that the waves were less than a metre high. Mm. Um, uh, if you've got the swash structures, you can be further down the beach where the waves are actually breaking rather than uprushing, you should have ripples being preserved on the same beach. And that might be the better place to try and work it out. That's really interesting. Thank you. You should read the thesis. <laughs> All right, um, we have another question from Marshall, but before um, I turn it over to him, I just wanted to let everybody know that it has reached four o'clock, at least in Seattle. So if you did have somewhere else to go, um, you might want to do that. But um, Roger, if you'll stick around um, and ask, uh, maybe you can answer a question from, from Marshall. Thanks, Roger. I re really appreciate the uh, level of detail in the formation mechanism for talking about the swash structures. Um, I did have a couple of thoughts, though. So one, you, you only cited these examples of these structures at beaches, and uh, so they were forming from seawater. And at that, that gave me a couple of thoughts. One is, do you think the salt is important for their formation? That's something that you had said might help maintain the, the structures with the steep sides. So do you think salt might be important for like preserving them in the geologic record? And um, could there potentially be dissolved material in the water, in the seawater that's helping them maintain their shape? That I, I'm thinking about like what are possible counterpoints that like the uh, authors that you're trying to refute might bring up. 
Okay, so with regard to the salt, um, we haven't made in sections of these things to prove that they're actually getting cemented by salt from evaporating seawater, but you can taste it there. So I'm presuming it's there and adding some coherency to the sand. That said, remember we also looked at estuarine beaches, which are by definition mixtures between river water and seawater, and so are only brackish. They're not as saline as seawater. And in the estuarine beaches, you find them forming as well. So you don't have to have really salty water in order to get them to form and to stick around at least for a few days. Um, that said, I haven't been to a freshwater lake and observed these structures yet, but we will do it. So um, that is a, a, a worthwhile question that needs to be followed up on. Um, I should say with all these um, aspects of the formation mechanism, this is just Michael Hughes and myself uh, uh, hypothesizing as to what might be processes. We haven't proved any of these, but Hughes is you know, one of the world's experts on squash zone processes. And he says, uh, relative hydrophobicity, cap capillary action, and um, water surface tension in uh, small pore spaces are all likely to provide cohering forces. Um, the second part of the question, was there some other factor that I hadn't considered that might be helping to bind these things? Uh, the obvious one that I'd considered and that I expect Nora Nofke would immediately think of when writing a counterblast to anything that I might write is, is there some sort of organic, dissolved organic scum in the water that is helping to um, not glue the grains together, but to add something sticky to their surface? So, they stay together. Um, I haven't analysed the water at any of these places. But the open surf beaches, uh, you don't get foam washing up on the beach or anything like that that would suggest there's a lot of dissolved or surfactant organic matter. Um, or, or, organic um, compounds uh, in that seawater. In the estuary, you do get um, organic foams washing up on the beach, but no foam versus foam, they still form. So I'm guessing that some sort of organic polymer acting as a adhesant is not involved, but I can't rule that out. Thanks. Thank you, Roger, and uh, thanks to everybody for their questions. Uh, so uh, that's the last of the questions, and so I'll wrap it up here. So let's uh, everybody thank Roger again for uh, the fascinating seminar today. And I'll look forward to seeing all of you at the next Astrobiology Seminar. Take care, everyone.